Hey, hobbyists. So this one is quite a bit different. It's a free form video. I'm not working off a script or anything like that. I haven't done anything like this in quite a while, but we're on my desktop and close it. We have Hobby Linux in the background. In fact, I should have been prepared. NeoFetch tells us that this is Hobby Linux. We have Tux instead of the Arch logo. So yeah, what we're going to do here is make it even bigger so we don't have to deal with that second title bar. And we're going to do a pull request. So I've got two branches. Um, actually, let's rewind. This is the Hobby Linux GitHub repository. It's github.com slash Hobby Linux. Um, there's not much here. There's like a little readme. We have an installer, wallpapers, uh, and then the actual like website thing, which isn't live, but never mind that. We're looking at the installer, and the installer is basically the nucleus of Hobby Linux. It is the first piece of code. It is the first resemblance of a Linux distro, as it were. Somebody left a comment. They said, well, how do you get started with, like, what do you do? What is a Linux distro? I don't know. Take Arch and change the name. Boom, you have a distro. So, but what this is, is the Hobby Linux installer. It is a bash script. Right now there's like a Ruby script and that's because I was using just one branch for everything, like all my development and I decided not to. But the installer is at this point, uh, not at the end of this video, but right now the installer is just this bash script and it's actually a little more verbose than it needs to be. It could be even smaller, but it does all of this work in about 65 lines of code. It could probably do it. It could probably do a full Arch install in about 20 lines of code. So what I'm doing is I'm going to be creating a pull request, a brand spanking new one, and we're going to be comparing my Ruby branch to the main branch. These are all my commits. We're going to squash these at the end because we don't need all of them. We've made nine changes and I'm going to go through each and every one of these and I'm going to roast my own code. Ruby, eg, roasts. No, I'm not going to call it that. I might change my mind halfway through the video anyway. So let's just do bash to Ruby refactor. Rewrite the bash installer into Ruby and make it easier and basically just better. Boom. There you go. So I'm going to assign it to me. I'm going to review my own code. Oh. I can't. Well, I'm doing it anyway. And now we have it. We have bash to Ruby refactor with all of these commits and there should be a way to squash it. Does it do it automatically? I'm actually not super familiar with GitHub as, as much as I am with GitLab. The last, the last company I worked at, we used GitLab and I got really familiar with that workflow. And it's been a while since I've worked with GitHub. Um, I don't know if this is the easiest way for you to see what's going on. Um, this is mostly for me because I, I really am. I want to review my own code. I wrote pretty much all of this Ruby code yesterday in, in a, in a uh, energy drink fueled blur in about two hours. And I want to go back with a, a clean mind and figure out what in the heck I did. So let's take a look at this code space create a new code space. I've never done this. So I'm hoping that it's going to be like a VS code instant. Hey, it is. <laughs> it's a web VS code. That's exactly what I was hoping it was going to be. GitLab has this too. That's why I knew that. That's why I knew that this was a possibility. All right. Welcome to code spaces. Uh, we got runtimes for Python, Node, Docker. Uh, we're in Ruby and it's figured that out. So here is the preview. This is, this is Markdown, but we're seeing it like the preview. I, I don't think I messed around with this. I will have to update the readme because this is probably going to change. But I want to get this merged into main, so I don't know if we're going to do that. Uh, we definitely won't do it here, but I might create a new branch and deal with it then. Deal with it there or whatever. Okay, so this isn't a side-by-side -side diff. Oh, here we go. Cool, cool. Okay, so this is the same view as we just had in GitHub, and there's all this additional stuff going on. Okay. Yeah, we can do this. This is how I'm kind of used to doing um, MRs, merge requests, as they are in GitLab. Okay, so we have rewritten the Ruby installer. I put a stub in here. It was basically uh, just options parser, which it still is, but we're just doing um, print install, just kind of want to see like a sanity test and it worked fine. But we filled it out 
And the actual CLI installer should be very simple. There shouldn't be any logic going on in here. If you're unfamiliar with Ruby, puts is basically like log or echo or print. It's just console.log basically, only it's, it's puts in Ruby. And I probably don't have to put everything. I'm just logging more than I need to because I'm working on it. But as with the bash script, which will pop out over here, or wait, you know, this, this won't be the last code review I do. So if you prefer, if you hobbyists prefer it being dark instead of a light theme, let me know and I'll, I'll do that next time. So we follow kind of the same, the same sort of thing. If with the bash installer, if we run install, it's going to partition, mount, bootstrap, desktop, and then add user. On the Ruby side, it's the exact same thing. So there's no difference here. On the bash side, I had to add all of these echoes to show what we're working on. And this is this this little CLI skeleton that I made is actually based on another project I made years ago. And this is probably simpler. Like this is actually kind of ugly. It should be probably like a help function, but it, it, it works fine. On the Ruby side, option parser does that for free. And you get this nice little banner, which I'd normally have to do here. So just simply switching to Ruby makes this code way shorter, which is nice. So let's take a look at some of the implementation. So this is the bash stuff over here. Partition is pretty straightforward. Where do, why do these weird things keep floating around? These little like title things, kind of obnoxious. All right, so partition, it's pretty much the same thing. We have echo, echo, echo. In Ruby, these backticks are, semant are command substitutions. So what I should be doing actually is puts, doing a put there or something, but I mean, it just kind of gets tossed out. I think it might be swallowed by the installer. Well, we're putting it there, so, but I don't know if these float up. Eh. These functions are private within a private block. I don't think I do that in Bootstrap, do I? No, Bootstrap just does a bunch of random stuff. We'll get there in a second. But these functions are private because they're not meant to be called outside of um, outside of this this block of functions. So the installer just calls the partition function, which calls these three functions. So an alternative would be to make these public and then just call all of these from the installer like that. And that'd be obnoxious. So I just wrapped it together like that. And it seems to work pretty good. So yeah, that's partition. Um, the way that I'm working with fdisk is I'm echoing all of these letters and new lines straight into fdisk. The drive is hard coded as SDA, which is not good. That is a bug and it will be fixed in some later version. It needs to be passed in as like something like um, drive and then you just kind of pass it, pass it in all the way down. But it's, it's basically a global and it, it works fine. I'll fix it later. So now let me show you Bootstrap. This is where most of my work went into yesterday. Bootstrap and helpers. This is, this is pretty cool, cool Ruby stuff that I'm pretty proud of. So over in Bootstrap land, it gets pretty gnarly in the bash script. We have Packstrap and then two, these are two bugs. I'm supposed to be doing these in the Chirrut, but instead I'm running them on the, the live environment. So, and this is also really kludgy. I'm assuming that the first input is going to be time date, like the time zone and yeah, I don't know about that. I don't have a working solution over here, though. In fact, I don't even think we're setting the, the time zone. <laughs> we're not using NTP or anything on the on the first install, so that's another bug I'll have to fix. But after that, it's just a whole bunch of arch truths all the way down, and it's running bash and then passing commands straight into bash, which is, I mean, more or less what what I'm do what I'm still doing in Ruby. But rather than calling arch truth a whole bunch of times, I wrote a helper arch root runner, which grabs the command, turns it into an arch root command, and then streams it. And the reason why I'm using popen is so that I can get the output on the spot. When you use command substitution, like where was I doing that partition? So command substitution with these back ticks, it runs the command and then it returns you the entire output all at once. So if you have a long running command, it's going to sit there with nothing. You're going to think that the application locked up or something. And then randomly, it's just going to spit out this huge string. And if it's bigger than the buffer, then that can cause problems too. So popen just allows you to kind of spit out each line as it comes. 
the markup is kind of weird. So like where the line is equal to IO gets. So basically when there is something to get, assign it to line and then put it. Chomping just removes the, the tail end of it, but it's a cosmetic thing. So I use a lot of these stream things. There's art, there's like raw arched root runners. I don't know why though. Is there a reason why I was doing that? I'm actually kind of curious. I don't want to mess around with it. I I may have just forgotten it. There, I'm using one here too. I don't know. I'm not going to mess with it. I tested the code. I, I have boxes open. I I have a, a sanity box here that doesn't appear to want to load. Here we go. Yeah. So I just ran this code in this box. And as you can see, it created a brand new hobby Linux system. So I know it works. And I don't want to mess with the code that's there. So I'm just going to leave these as arched root runners, even though there's no real reason for them to be that. There's some other helper functions too. I got the sed and activate service function. So all these do are return strings based on what you're asking for. There's a Pac-Man install, uh, which I think I was going to use here. Oh, this is still, the desktop install is still using the old style. It's using command substitutions, which isn't the end of the world, but it's not, it's not ideal. I wrote a function called pacman install, which doesn't use the stream function. So this actually needs to be refactored too. Um, I think this actually might be, there's nothing else really for me to look at. I was thinking I would look really close at this stuff and, and try to do a more thorough a more thorough code review, but I can't narrate and narrate, especially narrate live and also concentrate on what the code is supposed to look like. All right, it was desktop. Let's put a comment here, refactor. Well, actually, there you go. I wanna shout at myself each time. And where was the other one? Um, these two, oh, this needs to use the stream command again. I don't know why I did that. So that's the sed and that is the activate service. So there's a function called add user, default name is hobby, and it moves a file called add users and runs it in the cheroot. And before what I would do in the bash script is generate the add user script on the spot. It was really nasty. So in the original bash installer, the add user command would would build a script like it would build the file and then it would echo it to a to like a file that you could run and then it would run it and delete it and that's what i needed this disable shell check in 2016 is because you're not supposed to do that i think it was a uh, unassigned variable or something and it would it, it caused trouble so what i've what i did instead with the ruby branch is i extracted that code into a file like i should have and we just run it that way. So now it's a proper file with uh, this. These shouldn't be hard coded, obviously. We'll probably turn it into a function that I can pass. Uh, there's better ways of doing it, basically. But now it's a function that is called by the Ruby script. That is all it does, is it copies the file and then runs it. So it's more secure and it's better and it's how it should have been done from the beginning. All right, I think I'm just going to merge it. So I already, already closed one of the... <laughs> One of them. So code is good. Confirm merge. Oh, I got to update that email. I'm EGIO, not Ocean Edge anymore. There it is. It's the latest code. So now what I will do is go to boxes. I've already got these two open. And we're going to install a brand new Arch Linux. And we're going to call this one Hobby Linux with latest from installer uh, repo. <laughs> And drop in. Now I'm using an Arch ISO from April 1st. So it's April 9th. This one should be okay. Though I think actually this one might be missing the latest patches from XZ, I think. It should be okay. But we need Git and we need Ruby. And then we need uh, Git clone hobby Linux and start, wait, no. <laughs> github.com slash hobby linux slash installer dot git cd hobby no wait cd installer oh, i have no reason to go any further than there got to install about 
50 megabytes, which doesn't sound like a lot, but this is the live environment, so you gotta be careful about what you install. You can't go totally crazy. All right, we're in. Now, it, I have a bin folder, and the bin folder is supposed to be a sim link that attaches back to whichever the main file and source is. But with the, the addition of the scripts folder, that bin, the, the bin sim link doesn't work anymore. So I, I don't know if there's even gonna be a bin folder at this point. I might just toss that out. So now what we do is we do Ruby installer. If you ever run this at this point in time, it may change to a commander CLI, but if you use option parser, options parser, and you just run it without anything, you get nothing. And it seems like it's broken. But if you do dash dash help, then you get the help. So I, I, I don't know if there's a way to make help the default. It's kind of weird that if you run it with no arguments, it does literally nothing. But what we want to do is run it with dash I and away it goes. Now it does hang at receiving packages for a little while. I think that it's it's doing the pack, like Pac-Man is doing its thing where it's showing you the downloads. For some reason that doesn't come through with Popen, but everything else does. But see, now everything else is coming through one by one. So I'm, I'm not sure, maybe Pac-Man like buffers the output and then, because I guess there's like, there's two different, there's two different layers of, of abstraction that the that the text buffer is being passed through. So maybe Popen doesn't doesn't get it from Pac-Man until. Yeah, that might be what it is. But anyway, it's installing the bootloader, it's doing keys and stuff. It's installing Arch with my own installer. The Hobby Linux installer, it's done. Wow, that was fast, okay. I was gonna mention that it uses six sys Linux for the bootloader because it's easy. Not not because I prefer it. I mean, I guess I kinda do, but it's it's just so easy. So I tried Grub at first. Grub was a pain. Sys system Dboot didn't work in the VM, and SysLinux worked out of the box. That's that's what I mean. This is it. Here's SysLinux. It's nice and ugly, but it works. And now we're gonna boot into a hobby Linux. Watch it fail. There we go. Yeah, we're in. Like it's if it gets to the kernel, then it's definitely gonna work. So there it is. Bam. There's Light DM, Hobby Hobby, username and password, and that's it. So check this out. This is one of the design goals of Hobby Linux. 400 megabytes of memory used. And I know that there's always distros with less, but out of the box, that is the target. About 500 megabytes running at idle. No more than 1,000 for sure, but my target is 500. There's not really a whole lot happening. It's This system's all based around system D, but it doesn't have to be. It's just ease of development. And there does appear to be some kind of bug that has, does I have nothing to do with it, but it is that user work DB is just sitting there waiting. And I looked into it and I guess it is sysudo system CTL stop system D user DBD. We kill it and those go away. Now, I thought that that would have an impact on like Pulse Audio because Pulse Runs is a user daemon, but it doesn't. So I have no idea what that is. And it didn't even, it wasn't even using memory or resources or anything. It was just sitting there. I'm not sure what that is, but I've got development work to do still, obviously. But yeah, we have a very basic system with an Arch installer written in Ruby. And that's it. <laughs> So yeah, I'm going to wrap it up here. If you like this one and you liked what you saw, be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe. If you like Hobby Linux and you want to see more content or you want to see more about Hobby Linux and use it yourself, you can always become a member, become a hobbyist. Your support goes a long ways. I want to do these regularly. I'm doing weekly videos on my other channel, the ASMR channel, and I could do weekly content here too. So two videos a week isn't that that bad, but I got to know what people kind of content people want. They say, we want content. So I'm like, okay, I will make a Linux distro and <laughs> that will be content for people. And I'm into it. I'm into, I'm into hobby Linux and I'm into my design goals. And I think it's going to be really, really neat. So if you want to contribute to the cause, join and become a member. I appreciate it. But until next time, I appreciate all your support and thanks for watching.